2023 has seen a lot of big astrophysics results announced, and I've tried to cover a lot of them here on this channel, but I could never keep up with the publishing pace of my colleagues, because 28,000 astronomy papers were peer-reviewed and published in this year alone. Some of those made a bigger splash than others, though, so I figured since it's the last week of the year, let's count down my top five of the biggest space news stories of 2023. At number five, we have Betelgeuse, and this paper by Seiyo and collaborators that claimed that the star Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion could go supernova in the next few decades. Not centuries or millennia or the millions of year timescales that we're used to in astronomy, decades in our lifetimes. Now, Seo and collaborators looked at the regular pulsations in Betelgeuse's brightness that have been happening with a really regular pattern for decades. And Seo and collaborators pointed out that if you model the interior of Betelgeuse to try and recreate that pattern of pulsations in Betelgeuse's brightness, then Betelgeuse can't be in what's known as a hydrogen fusion stage, where it's fusing hydrogen into helium like most normal stars do, but in what's known as a carbon fusion stage towards the end of its life, where it's fusing carbon in its core to make magnesium. Now, in a star as massive as Betelgeuse, the carbon fusion stage only lasts for around a hundred years. And in Seo and collaborators' models, they found that the amount of carbon left in Betelgeuse's core was, in each case, less than 20%. It's used most of its carbon already, suggesting that the death of Betelgeuse by supernova is imminent, and we should detect the light from that supernova here on Earth in the next few decades. And it's forecast that if that happens, it should be bright enough to see during the day. There hasn't been a supernova in our own galaxy that we've been able to study since the 1600s. So clearly, us astronomers are really excited about this for how much we could learn from studying this supernova, but it turns out that all of you were really excited by the idea as well. This was my most watched video of the year. At number four, we have the launch of the highly anticipated Euclid Space Telescope back in July, with the first science images released in November. Now, Euclid is orbiting the stable point L2 with the James Webb Space Telescope and Gaia. But unlike JWST or even the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, which allow astronomers like myself to apply for time to use that telescope to do, you know, whatever specific science that they want to do, Euclid has just one job, which is to image a third of the entire sky to do a census of the position, shapes, and distances of all galaxies within 10 billion light years of Earth. Imagine the the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, but for a third of the entire sky. When the survey is done, when the survey is done, with all, when the survey is done, we're going to be able to make the most precise and detailed map of the universe ever made. And with that map, we're going to be able to do three things. First of all, we're going to study galaxy evolution. So galaxies at greater distances from us, that light from those galaxies takes a lot longer to travel through the universe to us. So we see those galaxies as they were billions of years ago. So then we can study how have they changed and evolved with time. Second of all, we're then going to be able to study dark matter. Because light from background galaxies will be distorted by galaxies and clusters of galaxies in the foreground, and that lets us work out where all the mass in the universe is. And then we can compare that to that map of where all the stuff that we can see is, take one from the other, and we have a map of where all the dark matter is. We can then use that map to better understand the distribution of dark matter and its properties as well. And then finally, the third thing is that we're going to study dark energy. We're going to study how the expansion rate of the universe has changed with time, because we can see, as we look at more and more distant galaxies and we see them as they were in the early universe, how their clumping and the space between them has changed with time. We've got a rough idea of what this trend of the change in the expansion rate of the universe looks like from previous, like, less detailed surveys, but Euclid is really going to help fill in the gaps here to get a more precise idea of what's going on, so that hopefully we can pinpoint what is causing this expansion acceleration to the expansion rate of the universe, i.e. what is dark energy. 
So Euclid is really set to be a game changer. And those first science images that were released were a wonderful sight to behold after so many years of waiting for it. I actually did a deep dive into what we could see in those images in a recent Night Sky News episode, if you want to check that out, along with my initial video on why there's so much hype around Euclid. The first data released from Euclid, though, when it's done about 20% of the survey that it intends to do, that won't be until early 2025. So got to be a little bit patient yet until the results from Euclid start rolling in. Number three is the successful return of the OSIRIS-REx mission, which brought back a sample of rock from the asteroid Bennu after it rendezvoused with the asteroid to collect the sample back in October 2020. This is a pristine asteroid sample that has never been contaminated by falling through Earth's atmosphere, unlike the, you know, the meteorites that we study after they've fallen to the ground. NASA have cracked open the sample already in a clean room and done some initial analysis. And those tests revealed that the asteroid contained some water and that it was made of 4.7% carbon by mass. That was way, 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 way higher than anyone was expecting. And it really did add another very convincing piece of evidence to the ever-growing pile that we have, that it was asteroids that brought water and the ingredients for life, i.e. carbon-containing molecules, to the very early Earth through a huge number of impacts. If you want to know more about the tests that NASA is planning to do, I went through the huge document that NASA put together detailing their sample analysis plan for a video on my channel, which I'll link below. Number two brings us to the James Webb Space Telescope and the discovery of overmassive galaxies in the early universe by Labby and collaborators. Galaxies that have grown too heavy in too short of a time for our best model of the universe to explain. Now, there's been a lot of very big JWST results announced this year, but I picked this one just because of the ripples it seems to have had through the entire astronomy community. I mean, even I've covered it four times on my channel this year in one way or another as people have tried to puzzle this out. So from this paper by Steinhardt and collaborators arguing that we're actually calculating the masses wrong because we're incorrectly assuming the same spread of masses of stars is forming in the early universe as it is today in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Or to this paper by Cameron and collaborators that was released just this month claiming to have found observational evidence with JWST for just that. Or even to this really quite fringe paper by Gupta claiming that we could actually explain these overmassive galaxies if the universe is actually twice as old as we think it is. Now, while I think that is very unlikely because we have a lot of evidence that suggests otherwise, what is becoming very clear now is that the early universe is very different to what we thought it was. And if it does turn out to be the case that it is because of that spread of stars that are forming in the early universe being different to what it is in the Milky Way and that assumption that it's the same being wrong, then every single early universe study that's calculated the masses of galaxies they're all going to have to redo their mass calculation. And then that has huge knock-on effects in all areas of galaxy evolution because we compare those masses to the star formation rates of galaxies in the early universe or the masses of the supermassive black holes in the centre of those galaxies. So this has huge ramifications across all of galaxy evolution and cosmology, which is why this paper by Labbe and collaborators is the JWST result that stood out to me most this year. Now, before we get to my number one pick, I just want to give an honourable mention to this research paper that didn't quite make my list by Medusa Dan and collaborators, who used JWST to study the atmosphere of the planet K218b and claim to have found some very weak evidence for what's known as a biosignature, a marker of life in a planet's atmosphere. You know, it's a molecule that the only chemistry that we know of that can produce it is life. It's known as dimethyl sulfide, but the problem is that you can confuse its signature that it leaves on the light that passes through the planet's atmosphere for just plain old methane. The problem is when this paper was released, it wasn't very well received by the rest of the exoplanet community. Like, you know, they thought that the analysis could have been a lot more thorough, and it was very likely that the evidence for that dimethyl sulfide was even weaker than they'd originally 
claimed. Obviously, despite that, the media still ran with marker of life found in exoplanet atmosphere. But, you know, I'm still not convinced of the results. Having said that, I think we are going to get, you know, a paper that claims to have strong evidence for a biosignature in an exoplanet's atmosphere very, very soon. Put it this way, it's on my 2024 bingo card. And I would be very surprised if I didn't cross it off. Finally, number one, my biggest astronomy news story of 2023 has to go to the detection of gravitational waves by pulsar timing arrays. This wasn't just one paper, but four separate papers by five international collaborations across the globe who all found evidence for light year long gravitational waves. These are ripples through space itself caused by cataclysmic events like the merger of two supermassive black holes. But there's always a chance it could be something else, some new physics. Now, this discovery was made possible by something known as pulsar timing arrays. So pulsars are dead stars spinning incredibly fast with beams of radio light from their poles that sweep out across the universe like a lighthouse. We see them as these flashes of light with these super precise times in between the flashes, almost like clocks, which brings me to timing. For 15 years, astronomers have been monitoring the time between these flashes of light to see if they ever changed, because speed equals distance over time. Because if the time changes, then it could be because the distance between the pulsar and Earth has changed because a gravitational wave passed through the space and squashed the distance between them. But to be sure that it's a gravitational wave, you have to see this with many pulsars in an array distributed across the entire galaxy, which you can then use to triangulate the positions and see if they change as the gravitational wave moves through them. That is what all four of the collaborations found when they looked at the data that the distances to the pulsars changed in such a way that gravitational waves had passed through. The big discussion though when these papers were released was what was causing these gravitational waves. The assumption had always been that it was from the merger of two supermassive black holes slowly spiraling together. But the data could be fit by other things as well. Brand new physics that we could still learn about, like for example, the inflation of the early universe or cosmic strings or even matter phase transitions. All of which I explained in more detail and you know dove into all the current evidence for which one was more likely in my video that I released back in July when the news was first announced to huge fanfare. You lot also enjoyed this little fun fact about how knowing the position of Jupiter precisely enough thanks to the Juno mission currently in orbit around Jupiter is what made this pulsar timing array gravitational wave discovery possible. So there you have it. Those are my top five biggest astronomy research news stories of 2023. And I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to see what 2024 will bring. At number four, we, that's not, that's <laughs> three, not four. I'm going to blame this on Christmas. <laughs> we see them as these flashes of we see them as these, mm, stop spitting everywhere. Sticky now, I've just spilt juice all over myself. And I don't know about you, but I can't resist, resist. No, I can't, cause I'm feeling 22. <laughs> and I don't know about you, I can't, I can't have to go into it. I'm feeling 22, it's just like, it's automatic. <laughs> I am not feeling 22. I am feeling my age of 33. Ooh. See, would a 22-year-old's back crack like that? I don't think so. 